Hi, welcome to this webinar on Investment Opportunities 2019. So before I start, let me just say that uh, all the information presented here, uh, based on my own opinions, I'm not a licensed financial advisor. This is not a recommendation to buy any of the mentioned uh, securities or stocks whatsoever. So this is you know, purely shared for educational purposes and to share with you the kind of investments that I make in my own personal capacity and the majority of stocks and ETFs that I'm presenting are ones that I already own and I continue to accumulate or I'm going to accumulate. So with that, let's begin. So before we talk about the opportunities this year, let's look at what's happened last year, where we're we coming from. So what happened in 2018? 2018 was a pretty uh, historical year because a couple of things happened. The first of which was that most global stock markets ended the year with a loss and entered a bear market towards the end of 2018. Specifically, the US market entered a bear market after seven years of being in a bull market. A bear market is uh, whenever the market drops by more than 20% from the high, and for me, I like to look at the moving averages, when the uh, medium term moving averages start to cross down. When the 50 moving average crosses below the 150, that's a signal of a bear market, which happened towards the end of 2018. So here's the interesting thing. The US entered a bear market despite great economics, despite great fundamentals. In fact, uh, the US reported a rise in GDP growth in 2018, which averaged 3.3% versus 2.5% the year before. So GDP was better than expected. And there was also remarkable S&P 500 earnings growth. So out of the 500 companies reporting earnings, uh, they showed a 25% growth in quarter one, 25% quarter two, 20% quarter three, and 10% in quarter four, which was projected which now they're beginning to report. So earnings was great, fundamentals was great. So what caused that bear market if fundamentals were great? Well, it was purely mainly psychological and I'll talk about that in a while. Um, let's talk about China. So besides the US, China uh, was in a bear market as well. And in fact, China, uh, where I look at the Shanghai Composite Index and the Hang Seng Index, as well as the UK FTSE 100 index, thanks to Brexit, had their worst performance in a decade. That's right. So both the China markets and the UK markets had the biggest decline in 10 years. And that's pretty significant. The MSCI All Country World Index. So if you look at uh, 23 of the developed countries as a whole, the entire index was down 11%, its biggest decline again in 10 years. So again, what's significant is that many countries showed its biggest decline last year over a decade. Okay? So as investors, we're really excited because it tells us that there are a lot of opportunities out there in the markets. Okay? So again, what triggered the bear market, specifically in the US? It was not so much economics or fundamentals because they were great. It was triggered mainly by the fear of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates too quickly. Okay, and that's what has caused them to announce a pause in interest rates in 2019. Hence, the market has begun to uh, rally back from there. The fear of slowing growth. So, you know, companies are still growing. GDP is growing, but it's growing less than uh, previous years. We're talking about earnings of companies over here, which is not too bad because it, it's, it's come from a very high uh, benchmark. Okay. There's also a fear of the yield curve flattening. And I'll talk a bit about that in a while because the flattening of the yield curve is normally a, a leading indicator of a potential recession. Of course, the overhang in the market would be the US-China trade war that hasn't found resolution yet. So the point was that the bear market sell-off was largely psychological. And for those of you following my YouTube videos uh, over the last couple of, um, well, my weekly or monthly videos would know that I anticipated that you'll be a very short bear market that will recover re really quickly, which it is right now. It is not really a recessionary bear market. It's a baby bear market because fundamentals remain good. It was just an emotional sell-off. So taking a look at the various in the, uh, indices, the US markets uh, were down between 6 to 7% for 2018. Uh, the UK market down 12%, again, the biggest decline in 10 years. 
Singapore, where I'm from, was down 10.75%. Shanghai down 24.6%. Again, this was huge. A quarter of its value lost in a year. The Hang Seng uh, was down 13.61%. And Malaysia, a lot of my students come from Malaysia, is down about 6, 6% or so. All right, Australia was down as well. So that's what happened in 2018. Uh, let's look at a couple of charts. So you can see the S&P started out the year pretty well, right? It, it was on a very clear uptrend, finding support at the 200 moving average and then finding support at the 50 moving average. And then in October 2018, that was when uh, the, the uptrend was broken and we began to reverse into a bear market over there. So my definition is when the 50 moving average, the blue line crosses below the 150 and they start to flatten and slope down, that is a uh, change in trend, the medium term trend. A at the same time, when the price breaks below the 200 moving average, which is the red line, and the 200 begins to slope down, which happened over here, that is also an indication of the change in the medium to long term trend. So this from the top all the way to the bottom, it was just about a 20% decline. So yes, this was officially a bear market. And like I said in my earlier videos, I expect a very short term baby bear for it to rally back very quickly, which it is going through right now. The rallies uh, taken place. So overall, the market started off here. It's down 7% for the year. Uh, if you break it down in terms of sectors, again, majority of sectors ended negative, uh, but two sectors managed to end positive, which was healthcare and utilities, because these are what we, what we call defensive sectors. Remember that in the markets, there are two kinds of companies. You have got cyclical companies and defensive companies. Defensive companies are companies where they sell products or services that are mainly recession-proof. It's not dependent on the economic situation. So in the worst recession, you still use electricity, you still have to buy water. In a recession, you still have to go for health services. So as a result, these are defensive sectors that will tend to hold up or even rise during a fear of a uh, recession. So let's take a look at this recent bear market uh, in a broader perspective. Let's zoom out and take a look at the last uh, 10 year chart of the S&P 500. So you can see that in the last 10 years, we, we've been in a very, very strong bull market. And this, the bull market basically started uh, back in 2009. Uh, and again, it's been a very, very strong bull market, as you can see all the way to where we are now. There was a baby bear market in 2011. As you can see, this lasted uh, just two or three months and this bear market was down 22% and again that was a baby bear market that was not tied to recession it was again a very emotional psychological sell-off that again allows us to pick up great companies at, at discounts before the next run so there was a bear market over there and we are currently uh, in another bear market which again I say is a very baby bear market that gives us again great opportunities to pick up great companies at discounts and this bear market is the first bear market over the last seven years. Uh, again, this bear market happened in 2011. Uh, this happened in 2018. Uh, over here, you can see a bit of a sell-off, but this did not constitute a bear market because it was only a 15% um, correction, right? So bear markets could be more than 20%. So uh, despite this bear market, this correction, and where we are now, you can see the market still up 204% uh, since the start of uh, this major bull market, right? So the lesson is always remember that the index will always go up in the long run. You always win when you hold long enough. And again, this applies only to the index. We can buy ETFs to track the index or you're buying fundamentally very good companies. So when you buy good companies and ETFs, they will always go up in the long run and short term corrections and bear markets are opportunity to collect shares at discounts. And again, this is from an investment perspective all right from a trading perspective we can make money in the short term by going long and going short as well and that's not in our professional stock trading courses for investments we focus more on that on our on my value momentum investing course which you can uh, enroll in as well all right so anyway so 
let's look specifically at China because you're gonna hear a lot of uh, a lot about China in this webinar because that's where I see the greatest uh, profit making opportunity in the next couple of years so first of all where are we coming from now China had it had its worst stock market performance in a decade in 2018 the Shanghai Composite Index is down 24.6%. Again, it's worst decline since 2008. The Hong Kong Hang Seng Index is down 13.61%. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, Hong Kong is part of China, okay? And in the US, we look at the Dow Jones, the S&P, and the NASDAQ. Yeah, they're three main indexes, right? In China, there are three main indexes I look at as well, all right? The Shanghai Composite Index, which is mainly mainland shares in China. Uh, and we've got the Hang Seng Index, which tracks the Hong Kong uh, territory of China. And I would say that a lot of the very, very um, successful growth companies are actually listed in Hong Kong from you know, Tencent and, and Ping An Insurance and, and all those things. So, I tend to focus actually a bit more in the Hong Kong markets because they are more volatile. Sorry, they are less volatile as compared to the Shanghai markets, right? The Hong Kong markets, uh, a lot of the the trading is from institutions, institutional investors. Whereas in Shanghai, it's more of retail investors, so it's, it's a lot more volatile. The third one is the Shenzhen Index, which I don't really pay attention to that much. So it's going to be more of the Shanghai and Hong Kong index. Uh, which I look at for the China market. So again, why did China have this big uh, decline? It was because of mainly the trade war started by you know Donald J. Trump, <laughs> and both countries were retaliating, slapping tariffs on each other, and of course we've got the Chinese devaluation against the U.S. to become more competitive. Concerns with China's slowing domestic economy, uh, but it's nothing new, right? There's always been concern that China's domestic economy has been slowing. It is slowing, but remember that China, uh, although it's slowing, it's still growing at 6.3% GDP as compared to 2 to 3% in the US. So China is still growing at almost triple the rate of the US economy, okay? Uh, the other thing is deleveraging of high debt levels in Chinese companies. So over the years, uh, Chinese companies have taken on, taken on a lot of debt in order to grow and expand, especially in the real estate, real estate sector. And debt levels have been very high and worrying, but now they're beginning to deleverage, which means they're beginning to uh, lower their debt levels. And of course, in the short term, that impacts their, their growth as well. But in the long term, it's a good thing with less debt, um, more stabilities in the balance sheets of those companies. Now, in, in China, basically all sectors were down. There was no sector that was spared. The worst performing sector was technology, down 34%, and utilities, defensive as well, but down 11%. So China really had a really bad year in 2018. Looking at some charts, this is the Hang Seng Index. Uh, that was down 13.61%. And you can see the Shanghai index was on a very clear downtrend from the beginning, down 24.6% 2018. So that's where we're coming from. So having said that, what are the opportunities in 2019 and beyond knowing that we came off one of the worst declines in, in China, for example? Okay. Now, before I continue, let's remember something. How is money made? How are great fortunes made? In Chinese... The word crisis is wei ji. And it's made up of two root words, wei and ji. Wei means danger and ji means opportunity. So the ancient Chinese uh, thousands of years ago knew that in crisis, there's danger, but there lies opportunity. In the American world, in, in the US, we've had Warren Buffett has often said, how did he build his fortune? by being fearful when others are greedy and by being greedy when others are fearful. So in other words, the time when he invests the most in the markets is when there's fear in the markets. And there's a lot of fear in the China markets because of, of this decline. And that's when you can pick up great companies at huge discounts. And they've been 
many people, especially John D. Rockefeller, who said the way to make money is to buy when there's blood running on the streets, when there's panic. Okay, and there's a lot of blood running on Chinese streets right now. So, having said that, how do we take advantage of the China stock market? Is it a value investment opportunity? So first, let's take a look at it from a technical perspective. Let's study the charts and the statistics behind the charts. So for the last 24 years, you can see like most other indexes, the Shanghai index uh, rose uh, a total of 279% from 1995 to 2019. So that's the total return in terms of capital gain. Uh, the annualized capital gain is about 7% and the average dividend yield is about 2%. So if you add it together, the total annualized return with dividends reinvested, it's about 9.26%. Right? So that's the long run return of the, of the China index. Meaning to say, if you were to buy an ETF that tracks the, the China market and you just you know, close your eyes and hold it for the long run, you should be expecting about 9% annualized return okay uh, that's if you just buy and hold it so the question is when's the best time to enter uh, the index the ETF we, we don't want to buy when it's near the top obviously we want to buy when it's uh, near the bottom of the uptrend again making a dip on the uptrend so let's take a look at how we break down that 24 year um, market into bear markets and bull markets. Now, if you've watched my previous videos, you've taken my courses, you know, I always say that <coughs> um, that a market goes through bull and bear cycles. So after every bear market will always be the next bull market. After every bull market is the next bear market. So after summer, you're going to have winter. After winter, you're going to have summer. So the biggest money is made on knowing when to catch the next summer and being and having the courage to buy towards the end of winter, towards the end of the bear market, okay? So let's take a look. And you can see that back in 1995, uh, the China market started with a 61% plunge. There was a bear market. And after that bear market, it was followed by the bull market that took it up 362%. So remember that bull markets will always uh, gain more than the losses in bear markets. Okay. Most of the time, the market's always in a bull market. And then we had a 32% bear market. This was a baby bear, followed by a 112% bull market, 56% bear market, and then a 512% bull market, 73% bear market, 200% bull market, and currently right now, we're in the midst of a 51% bear market that started in 2015. We are currently here right now. So we know that after this bear market, there will be the next bull market. Okay, But the question is always, where is the bottom of the bear market? Now, we can always make an intelligent guess, but we can't always get it right exactly. But we don't have to get it right exactly to make some really good money. So let me share with you as a professional investor, as a trader, how do we manage our entries? How do we manage our risks to always make sure we make money eventually? Okay, so here's my thought process. <clears throat> now currently, this bear market we're in in China, we're down 51% so far. Now how much lower can it go? Okay, now historically, you can see that China has been down 73%. It has happened before, 73%. Um, 61%, 50%. So the average bear market is about, about 40 to 50%, right? Average. So we, you could say that we are already at the end of this bear market, right? At 51%. But could it drop another 20% to match this bear market? Sure, anything's possible. Okay, so here's the point. The point is, if you were to buy right now at this, at this point, it could still go down. <coughs> another 20 percent possibly correct but eventually the bear market will have to end it will have to bottom eventually okay so the maximum downside from where we are is about 20 percent okay that's how much more we can go if it does go lower but when the bull market starts what gains are we looking at 
when the, the next bull market begins? Well, again, historically, bull markets can be anywhere from 100% to 500%. Okay, so let's take the, the, an average of about 400%. Okay, which is, you know, or maybe 362%. So I expect that the next bull market is gonna be anywhere from 300 to 500% in growth. Or you're gonna triple your money or see your money increasing by five times. Okay, so what's my point? See, as investors, you always look at it from a risk to return perspective. So I am risking a potential 20% more drop for a potential three to 500% return. Is that a good deal? Okay, in other words, I'm risking, you know, think about it, I'm risking $20 to make a potential, you know, $400, for example. Okay, or you can also think of it as I'm, I'm risking a dollar to make $20. That's a pretty good done deal, right? Yeah, and I know it's eventually gonna go up. It's only a question of when, having the patience and the confidence to hold it till that happens, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, I'm already buying at this level. I've been buying, okay? Now, here's the thing, as an investor, remember, never go all in at one time. Never say, okay, here are all my chips, I'm gonna mortgage my mother's house, I'm gonna pop my wife's jewelry, I'm gonna put everything in. Never do that. Always invest money which you can afford to not use or look at for the next couple of years. So you don't get emotionally affected if it goes lower, right? And always manage your risk. And when you invest, always invest in stages. So if you wanna invest, for example, $1,000, don't put in $1,000 right now. Okay, put in, for example, two grand first, another two grand, another two grand. So average your way in, we call that dollar cost averaging, okay? So let me give you an example of how that works. So let's imagine again that right now we are down 50%, okay? And let's imagine I start to buy here. I buy, you know, off 10 grand, Say I buy 2.5 grand. And again, I do not blindly buy on a downtrend. I will only buy when I see signs of a uptrend reversal, which is happening right now, okay? So it's going to an uptrend and I'm starting to buy right now. Now, it could be a fake out. Sometimes you could have a false breakout where you think it's going up and you buy and boom, it goes lower. It can happen, right? So if it continues going down, am I gonna buy more? Not yet, because never catch a falling knife. Never buy on a downtrend. Wait for the next uptrend reversal. So say at this point, it starts to reverse again. Oh, okay, it's going up, going up. This could be the potential bottom again. I'm going to buy another 2.5 grand over there, for example. And let's imagine this was another false reversal. Again, the market can fake you out, just like in sports. Right? I'm going to fake you out, right? This is going to buy, and then boom, goes down again. Could that happen? Sure, okay. And then you know it goes down again and you're waiting for the next reversal and it starts to reverse again, right? Where the price starts to make higher highs and higher lows. And it's okay, let's go in over there. Now, granted, you could get caught in a few false reversals. Now, but eventually, will it bottom? Of course. Every winter will come to an end. Okay, but you never know exactly when it is. So let's say this was the one that was indeed the bottom. After you get faked out twice, that was the bottom. And once you caught that bottom, what will happen? You'll start to really, really start the new bull run. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna add another 2.5K over there. And eventually this is gonna go up to again, 300% to 500% return. Okay, now, did you buy exactly at the bottom? Maybe not, right? So you could have bought some over here, some over here, some over here, and some over here. So if you average, take an average of your entry, it will be probably somewhere, let me use a green line to mark it up. You'll probably be somewhere over here, which means you may not have gotten it at, at the exact bottom, but you get in near enough the bottom so that you make tremendous profits when the next bull market happens. So that's how you enter from an investment perspective. And now this as an, as an investor, we do not use a stop loss, okay? Because we are confident that it's gonna go up in the long run. Now, for some of you who are using it from a trading perspective, as a trader, we place a stop loss. If it hits our stop loss, we get out, we lose a certain percentage of our capital, we get on the horse again once we see the next signal. 
So let me just share with you now from a trading perspective, how you play the same game from a trading perspective, all right? So market's down. Again, it's down 50%. And you start to see, hey, it's beginning to show signs of a reversal to an uptrend. So what you do as a trader, you would put a buy order, right? You buy there, you enter over there, and you put a stop loss somewhere below the uh, low, the recent low. And this would be your one hour risk, as you've learned in, in my trading courses. So this one hour could be you're risking, for example, 1% of your total portfolio or risking 2%, whatever it is, right? But don't risk more than 2 to 3%, okay? So imagine you get in, and what happens? Again, it could be a false breakout. It comes back down and hits your stop loss. Boom, trade over, you get out. And it's a losing trade, right? So you've had one losing trade and you lost, for example, 2% of your capital. Could happen, right? So what you do? You be patient, don't take revenge on the market, wait for the next signal. So say the market goes down again waiting for the next signal, waiting for the next signal. Okay, it's coming up now. You're seeing a signal from the moving averages, right? from the price actually, okay, it's reversing. And what you do, you do the same thing. Correct, you, you, you enter over there, you put your stop loss over there. And again, you risk the same one hour. And let's imagine this happened to also be a losing trade. Possible, sure, anything can happen in the markets, right? And it goes up a bit and poof, hits your stop loss, done. You're down another loss. You're down another 2%, for example. And say it goes down again, right? And you're patiently waiting for the next signal. And then, and then again, now you see the signals coming up again, right? Moving averages are crossing over. The 20 EMA is crossing above the 40 EMA. The 50 is above the 150, right? Whatever technical signal you use. Or price makes high highs and higher lows, right? So once you see that, what do you do? That's right, you place your entry price, again, you put a stop loss over there, you're risking, again, one R. And let's say this happens to be the winning trade. All right, so remember in trading, you never know when it's gonna be a losing trade, you never know when it's gonna be a winning trade. But as long as you follow the rules of entering on uptrend signals, you're gonna be right more than you're wrong over time. And your average win will be more than your average loss. So cut your losses short, let your winners run. So this happens to be a winning trade. So after you enter, it breaks out and boom, you catch the next rally all the way up to infinity and beyond. <laughs> okay. So this was a winning trade. So you have two losing trades and one winning trade, for example, right? But when you win, guess what? You're winning multiples of your risk. So you, when you lost, you lost one hour, you lost 2%. When you win, you may end up winning, you know, five hour or 10 hour. And that could be a 20% gain or more. So you can see that in trading, even if you are right, one out of three times, you're right 30% of the time, you will still make money at the end of the day if you keep getting back on the horse when you have a valid trading signal, all right? So again, you could approach this from an investment perspective, buying, and dollar cost averaging down or from a trading perspective. But whatever it is, you can see from a technical perspective, this is giving us an opportunity to really profit from the next bull market that will come the moment this bear market ends in China, which we, it, it, it will pretty soon, looking at the technical chart action. Okay, so that's from a technical perspective. How about from a valuation perspective? Right. In other words, is the market expensive or cheap based on value? Now, how do you measure value? Well, one way is to look at, we call it the index PE ratio. Right. So again, if you've taken my courses, you know that PE stands for price divided by earnings. So how do you calculate the PE ratio of the index? You take the stock price of all the companies in the index based on its market capitalization, right? The, the, the market price of all the, the market value of the companies divided by all the net income of the companies, the earnings, you get the index PE ratio. So how do we use this? So whenever markets are at the high, whenever the stock market is expensive, prices are high 
compared to earnings. So PE is very high at the top. After a market crash, when the market's at the bottom of the cycle, prices tend to be very low relative to earnings. So PE is very low at the bottom of the cycle. So the question is, what is high and what is low? Well, it depends on historical benchmarks, correct? All right, so if you look at the Shanghai Composite Index for the last 16 years, right, from 2002 to 2018, you can see this is the PE ratio, and the highest PE was 70. That was crazy, it was over, it was a bubble that burst, okay? The lowest PE was 10. So you got the highest of 70, your lowest of 10, and if you take the center, that's about 40, right? 40. Um, and you can see the recent high has been about 20 over here. That has been the recent uh, high in the markets, as you can see here, okay? So question, where are we now? Now, what's the PE ratio of the Shanghai Composite Index right now? And the answer is, ta-da, 11.99 or 12, which means we are somewhere here. So what does it mean? It means in terms of valuation, the market, the China market is cheap. It is undervalued. It is below the historical high of, of 20 or even 40 or even 70. All right, so it's really cheap. How about the Hong Kong Hang Seng? The Hang Seng uh, index, you can see for the last 16 years, the highest has been 24. At the top of the market cycle, it's 24. The bottom is 5 at the low of the market cycle. The median is 15, which means anytime the PE is above 15, it's above fair value historically. Below 15 is undervalued. And right now we are at, ta-da, 10. All right, so we're at 10, which is in between the median to the lowest point ever reached. So you can see that the, the Hong Kong market is really undervalued as well. And that's why I've been accumulating a lot of China and Hong Kong stocks because it's really cheap and at the bottom of the bear market cycle. So we know that the China market is cheap, but what's the opportunity for growth? Well, let's take a look at it versus the US market. Now I've got to say that the majority of my investments are still in the US market. Previously, it was kind of like 90% in the US market, 10% in emerging markets. But in the last year or so, I've kind of like uh, shifted about 40% of my portfolio into emerging markets, specifically China market, but still 60% of my wealth is in the US markets. Okay, so um, I still see both markets growing, but I do see China uh, outperforming the US in the next couple of years at least. And, and the reason is this. Now, the US market is a $19.7 trillion market. Currently, China's only $5.9 trillion. Uh, the US economy is growing at 2 to 3% a year. China's growing at 6 to 7% a year. So it's growing at three times the rate of the US economy. Uh, the US has 300 million people and, the, uh, and China has close to 1.4 billion people. 50% of Americans own stocks but only 7% of Chinese-owned stocks currently. Do you see the potential for the future? Because as more and more Chinese uh, get familiar with the stock market as they become wealthier and they buy more shares, what's gonna happen? Yeah, eventually 50% of Chinese are gonna own stocks in, in the Chinese market, which means that there's a lot of potential demand that's gonna come in the future. And more demand versus supply is gonna push up stock prices in the long run. Now, the US market has a history of 224 years. And well, this chart just shows the last 90 years, where you can see 90 years ago, the S&P was something like about 19 points, one nine, right? It's now about 2,000, uh, 2,600, 2,800 points. So that's a 16% growth over the last 90 years. But China's stock market has only been around for less than 30 years, less than 30 years. So if you look at it in terms of perspective, 
you know, in the long run, markets will always go up. But in the short term, you have a lot of crisis, right? You had the Great Depression in the US, you had World War II, you had the oil crisis of the 1970s, you had the dot-com crash in the year 2000, you had the, the subprime mortgage crisis in, in 08, you had the trade war right now. So you got to remember that all these crises are temporary. Eventually, they will be resolved and eventually markets will go higher. All right. So the US has been a great way to build your wealth and it will still be a great way to build your wealth. But in China, if you think about it, China's only at the beginning, only at the beginning of its maturity as a market. So there's, again, tremendous opportunity. Now, so how do you gain access to the Chinese markets? All right. So, so there are a few ways to do it. One way is you can buy ETFs, right? exchange traded funds that track uh, the Chinese indexes. And there are a couple of them listed in the US markets. So you have got, uh, for example, GXC. Um, let me just write them down. If you just go on to Google and you search for China ETFs, you have a, a, an entire list. So you've got GXC, that's one of the ETFs uh, that you can buy in the US market that tracks the China uh, index. You have got the FXI, uh, you have got the CAF, you know, there are many, many ETFs that you could buy, all right? Uh, my favorite happens to be the GXC because it's got a lower management fees and it's got um, a, much, much, a much longer track record compared to the other ETFs. But again, there are, there are other ETFs that you could look at as well, all right? So you can Google China ETFs, take a look. Uh, which are the ones that are the most suitable for you. So again, if you just buy the China ETFs, uh, you're basically buying into the entire China market. Okay. So what's the bullish case for China? Like it or not, the long term growth of the world e economy is coming from China. Okay. Uh, the highest growth comes from the Chinese consumer technology sector especially in the next five to 10 years, as the country pivots to a more consumer-focused economy. And recently, MSCI, which is the Morgan Stanley Composite Index, recently included Shanghai shares in its Emerging Markets Index. And that would uh, uh, so-called get more foreign investors uh, to invest in China. Okay, so that expects to steer about 400 billion uh, renminbi or Chinese yen of foreign inflows into mainland China shares. Again, with more inflows into China shares, you can expect higher prices in the next five to 10 years. Now, here's the interesting thing. Despite growing its economy at double the US, China's index is at the low end of its historical benchmarks. Now, think about it. The US has been growing at three, two to three percent. Okay, two to three percent. China has been growing at 6 to 7%. So China is growing a lot faster than the US. But the US PE ratio is about 19, 1, 9, okay, close to 20. But China's PE ratio is 10 to 12. So you can see that it, it doesn't make sense. There's a big divergence between uh, performance and value. In other words, compared to the US, China is really cheap based on its growth rate. So. Uh, it, it can't go on forever, right? Eventually, China's uh, stock market has to uh, catch up uh, and show its true performance based on its growth, okay? The Chinese monetary cycle is also easing versus the US monetary cycle. So as you know, in the Fed, in the US, the Federal Reserve, they are in a rate hike cycle, which means they are, ra they are raising interest rates. They are, we call it quantitative, um, yeah, it's called monetary tightening, basically, right? But in China, it's the opposite. In China, they are not raising interest rates. If anything, they are holding or even possibly cutting interest rates and uh, creating a lot more stimulus or quantitative easing into the China markets that will, again, uh, give more liquidity to raise asset prices. Now, like I said, you know, I don't put all my money into China, okay? I still have majority of my money into the US markets, but 
again, a larger percentage into China. And that is great for what we call portfolio diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Separate your eggs into various baskets into different world markets. And here's the interesting thing. The historical average correlation between US stocks and China stocks is only 11%. And between US stocks and Hong Kong stocks is only 32%. And what that means is that even if the US goes into a bear market, it doesn't mean China's gonna go down. In fact, the US could go down, China could go up. So that's a great hedge on your portfolio to protect it against future bear markets in either markets. Now, besides buying the China ETFs, you could also focus on individual companies that's gonna redrive really the Chinese economy. And I personally look at uh, companies within the technology innovation sector. And my four favorite companies are what we call the BAT companies. Now, as you know, in the US, the five strongest uh, companies in terms of innovation and growth are the FANG companies. F-A-A, um, F-A-A, NG. So in the US, you gotta own the FANG companies, right? Uh, you made a lot of money owning FANG in the last couple of years. So F stands for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. So in China, they don't have the FANG stocks. They have got the BAT stocks, the B-A-T. So B-A-T stands for uh, Baidu. Um, A stands for Alibaba. T stands for Tencent. And my, person my personal uh, additional favorite is Ping An Insurance. So uh, these, to me, are the four best companies in China. And let me just explain why. So Baidu is China's number one search engine. There's 1.3, close to 1.4 billion Chinese and they search the web every day. They don't use Google, right? They use Baidu. And so Baidu is the equivalent of Google in China, right? So I own Alphabet that owns Google and YouTube in the US. It makes sense for me to own Baidu in China, okay, to cover all bases. So Baidu, besides being a number one search engine, is also a leader in deep learning, artificial intelligence, and driverless cars. So that's Baidu. Now, Alibaba is the so-called the Amazon equivalent in China as well as for B2B uh, businesses around the world. So uh, Alibaba is the uh, top e-commerce play in China and it's also a leader in world fintech disruption. So it owns a lot of fin, uh, financial technology companies as well. Um, in the US, you want to buy something, you go to Amazon, go to eBay, right? In China, they go to Taobao, which is the Chinese equivalent of buying stuff online. They uh, go to Tmall. And uh, in China, incre in increasingly in China, they do not use cash anymore. In fact, if you go to China, uh, recently I went to China, you know, they don't use cash anymore. They pay not with credit cards, not with cash, they pay using all these apps, right? In the US, increasingly people are using Apple Pay. Uh, in China, they're using Alipay, okay? So they make a lot of money from the uh, financial transactions part of the business as well. Now, Tencent is interesting. Um, in the US, around the world, we, we use um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp as our social media. In China, they don't use any of those. In China, they use WeChat. And WeChat has over a billion users. So WeChat is not just uh, for communicating. It's not just like WhatsApp, uh, right? It's not just like um, Telegram, right? But they use it to pay for stuff. They use it to um, play games. They use it as well to um, order food and things online, right? So if you think about WeChat, is the equivalent of Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, PayPal, Skype and Uber all rolled into one, all right? So it is the must-owned company for Chinese communication and services, all right? It's also the worldwide leader of online gaming. Finally, we've got Ping An, and Ping An is the second largest insurance company in the entire world, and the largest insurance company in China. Um, in fact, the biggest insurance company in the world is um, Berkshire Hathaway, which is owned by Warren Buffett. And number two is Ping An Insurance. So these are the four companies that are the fastest growing in China. They will, they are monopolistic. They, they have got extreme 
league-wide economic modes with sustainable competitive advantage, so you can bet that in the long run, they will increase in value. But the good news is in the short term, because of the trade war, because of some temporary bad news, many of these companies have been on a downtrend and selling at 40 to 50% below their valuation. Right? In other words, they're really cheap. And I've been recently buying them as I begin to see their downtrend reversing into an uptrend. Let's take a look at some of these companies right now. Now, um, for example, if you look at Baidu, uh, that's B-I-D-U, by the way, these Chinese companies are listed in Hong Kong and they're also listed in the US. So if you want to trade in the US market, you can buy um, the Chinese uh, listed companies in the US. Uh, we call them ADRs or American Depository Receipts. Okay, So this is Baidu right, over here. And you can see that it was selling at 295 US dollars. But because of the trade war, it went on a downtrend all the way to $155. So again, that's almost a 50% discount to where it was. Okay, um, As you know, if you've taken our value momentum investing courses, you can use the intrinsic value calculator as part of the course to calculate the intrinsic value of these companies. All right, that's one way. Another way is you can also subscribe to uh, certain websites like Morningstar. Um, it's a subscription website where you're gonna pay like 400 US dollars a month, not sorry, a year or something like that. And you could also check out the valuation there. For example, if you look at Baidu. Uh, if you don't pay for the subscription, you can use our intrinsic value calculator to do a valuation as well, right? So you can see that by to the the fair value, the intrinsic value is for two hundred and sixty-two dollars. It's a fair value. What it what is worth based on its uh, fundamentals, uh, which means it's worth somewhere about there, about there, two hundred and sixty-two dollars, and it's now selling at hundred and sixty-eight dollars. Okay. So obviously on a downtrend, you don't want to buy it, right? Because again, on a downtrend, low can get lower, cheap can get cheaper. You don't want to catch a falling knife. You want to start to buy an initial position, right? When you see reversals into an uptrend. And as you can see over here, that these are early signs of a reversal, okay? Where from making lower highs, the stock's making lower highs, and lower lows, that's a clear downtrend. So you don't want to buy when you see lower highs and lower lows, right? But over here, you can begin to see early signs of a reversal. The price is making higher highs and higher lows. So this sign that the trend is changing, all right? So when the 20 EMA crosses above the 40 EMA and the 50 moving average starts sloping up, that's an early reversal signal. You can begin to take an early entry. And of course, when the 50 moving average crosses above the 150, then the uptrend is confirmed. All right. But by that time, the price would have moved to maybe about $200. Still undervalued, right? Um, but you could get in earlier uh, with some early signal. So that's buy to. Uh, the other one is Tencent, which I've already entered quite early on. In fact, I've talked a, a lot about it in my earlier videos. All right, so you can see that's ten cent. Um, right, you can see it was a very very clear uptrend, and this was the you know the trade war all the way on a downtrend. Again, it was selling at about fifty eight dollars, about fifty eight bucks over here, and it went all the way to um, about thirty one dollars. So again, it's a fifty percent discount. So again, Chinese stocks have been selling at a fifty percent discount, right? Despite the fact that these companies I'm mentioning, their sales are growing, their profit is going, it's still a great company. So they went down purely for psychological, emotional reasons. And like what I've learned from Warren Buffett, be greedy when others are fearful. That's how you get a bargain. But wait for the reversal. So you can see that I, I didn't buy during the downtrend, but this was an early reversal signal over here, the change in trend. So I started buying somewhere over here. Um, as you can see over here, the 20 EMA crossing above the 40 EMA. 
that's a short term uptrend signal the the price getting above the 50 moving average 50 sloping up right so that was a great time to uh, start buying over there and now you can see the price the 50 is beginning to cross above the 150 and the moment they start sloping up that's a confirmation of the new uh, bull run in this stock again you can see a clear downtrend over here and a change in trend over there where the price makes higher highs and higher lows all right so the same thing goes with ping on insurance i won't go into detail as well as um alibaba right so the same pattern right down 50 percent reversing i get it so this is how i've built my fortune over the last 27 years of being in in the u.s markets and in the in the china markets right so i wait for a big crash undervalued i see early signs of reversal i start getting in i make a lot of money and and that's how i do it right besides my stock trading which i do daily and my intraday forex trading as well so as a professional investor and trader i've got multiple sources of income all right on one hand i'm investing on the other hand i'm trading uh, stocks i'm trading forex on an intraday basis as well as using options to enhance my portfolio and to protect my portfolio during bear markets so once you've learned all these strategies all these skills you become unstoppable in the markets and that's how you build your wealth beating you know most other people out there uh, in the markets so great opportunity in china let's look at the us right now so i've been talking a lot about us markets in my regular video so i'm just going to be repeating some of them and reinforcing some ideas all right so looking at the s p 500 so as i've mentioned before um we started the correction or rather the, the bear market in october last year so the s p was at a high of 2940 and that's when we started a bear market uh, all the way down to here so from the top to the bottom is about 20 percent decline and if you watch my earlier videos i did mention that i believe that this was a non-recessionary bear market okay uh, what that means is that i expect it to be a very short bear market that will last just a few months and you'll go back to a bull market again and the reason i don't believe that it's going to be a recessionary bear market is because the yield curve has not inverted yet all right it's flattening and if the yield curve does invert it would invert uh probably the middle of this year which means that a recession would start at the very earliest next year, right? So I don't see that happening yet. So I expected to see a, a, a very short bear market, a great chance to buy stocks at a discount, and it goes back up. So what happened was there was a big plunge, and over here, we call that a parabolic plunge, where the market drops 90 degrees. Now, every time you see the market going 90 degrees and having a series of bearish candles where you've got more than five bearish candles in a row we've in fact had about one two three four five six like eight bearish candles in a row and we had a very strong bullish um reversal pattern we call that a one white soldier pattern all right that's taught in my candlestick videos okay the moment you see that you know that it's going to reverse right so that was a reversal went all the way up now, in my earlier videos, I did say I anticipated that the market will not have a V-shaped recovery all the time. Likely, it was going to go up and it's going to hit a resistance and do a double bottom. Okay, you'll, you'll have a double bottom and then you'll reverse into a new bull market. That's what I anticipated. And I anticipated that this level over here at 2,600 would be the resistance level like like as you know in a market you can't predict the future you can only have an anticipation and you act only when the market confirms your anticipation through the price action so did it happen no it did not happen because the price went up and blew through this level of resistance it went up blew up and came down and now this support or rather this resistance has now become a new support so it bounced off the support it went up and it found slight resistance at the 200 moving average which i don't think is going to hold i think it's going to blast all the way up to 2800 so 
2800 this is our next level of resistance it's a strong resistance there so i'm going to watch this level really carefully right if the market cannot break this level right if it reverses back down strongly i expect that we're going to go all the way back down to make a new low double bottom and then start the new bull market okay but if it can break through this 2800 level then it's going to go then it's unlikely to go back down again it's going to probably go up and start the new bull market Right. So let's see what happens now. Um, so in my earlier videos, I've been talking about during this bear market, it was some really great opportunities. And one of the best opportunities that I saw was Facebook. Okay. That's right. There we go. So as you know, Facebook has been a darling stock in the markets, but it went on a big downtrend over here because of a lot of bad news like the data scandal and and so on and so forth and got fined and all that right so it went from two hundred dollars to a hundred and twenty dollars so again there was a fifty percent discount of facebook and facebook's a great company i will bet my bottom dollar in the long run facebook will only go higher because it's a monopoly in social media right what else are you going to use besides facebook instagram Instagram's owned by Facebook as well. What are you going to use? Twitter? Uh, well, <laughs> you're going to use what? Snapchat? Snapchat's for kids, right? <laughs> so Facebook is still the number one social media company that advertisers advertise with. You know, like it or not, right? And people say, I'm going to delete my account. Bullshit, okay? Their number of active users are still rising every single year and quarter. If it's not from the US, not from Europe, it's from the rest of the world, okay? So that's a great opportunity. And on a downtrend, the moment you saw a reversal there, that was the time to buy. So that's when I started buying and boom, we are up now to $165. You can bet it's going to go back to $200, $300 and, and, and up in the future. All right? I mean, it will not go up in a straight line. It may go up and down. You can bet it's going to go high in the long run because it is undervalued. Okay? If you do your valuation, Facebook's worth at least $200 bucks in terms of valuation. And... Right now, even at $165, you're still getting a pretty good discount of valuation for a long-run hold for Facebook. Some interesting data for you to ponder over, and credit goes to pension partners that uh, compiled this um, summary. So you can see that from 1929 to the present day, it's about 90 years. In the last 90 years, there have been about 21 bear markets. 21 bear markets, right? And out of the 21 bear markets, 11 of them have led to a recession. So that's 52%. So again, not every bear market is recessionary. Only half of them are. And the average bear market sees a decline of 29% without a recession. I call that a baby bear market. And those with a recession would see a 42% decline. And like I said, the one we're going through right now, you know, it's, it's without a recession. So it's an opportunity to get in and get some great companies in so to summarize uh, the u.s market like i said we've had remarkable s p earnings growth all right and so the bear market has been primarily psychological fear over uncertainty in the trade war brexit the federal reserve raising interest rates and fighting with donald trump the flattening yield curve so these are emotional problems that that get resolved eventually, all right? Um, it's kind of like your wife still loves you, all right? Fundamentally, she still has a heart for you. She still loves you. Your husband still loves you. They're just a bit short the nuts right now because of that time of the month, right? So just bear with them. They'll get okay pretty soon, right? And economic fundamentals are still strong, right? So employment growth is strong. Um, manufacturing growth is strong, although not as strong as before, but it's still growing. Uh, in 2019, the U.S. is projected to grow at 2.5%, uh, and earnings are projected to grow at 6.9%. So the point I'm making again is the current bear market is not likely to lead to a recession, and it presents an opportunity and presents an opportunity to buy good companies at a discount. However, I have to uh, say that the U.S. economy is at the late stage of its economic cycle. In this it's in its final inning in the game, all right? So because of that, 
do only have good quality companies in your portfolio, in your investment portfolio. Focus only in having fundamentally strong companies with resilient earnings that are less e economically sensitive. All right, so again, go through the seven steps you've learned on how to pick great companies in the value momentum investing course that if you're not enrolled into, please enroll in that and learn that is really, really important. Okay, now specifically, my preference is to invest, to have companies in technology, communication services, and financials. Technology, specifically, my favorite companies are Microsoft, Adobe, Salesforce, and I'm also looking at Applied Materials, which is still on a downtrend, early signs of a reversal. But of all of them, I would say my favorite is Microsoft, all right? Because they are dominant in a lot of areas right now, cloud computing and so on and so forth, and Adobe in software. Communications, my favorite would be Facebook and Alphabet, which is basically Google and YouTube. Financials, uh, JP Morgan, uh, BlackRock, and Goldman Sachs as it recovers from the one year MDB scandal, right? As interest rates will eventually rise in our rate hike cycle, a bank earnings will improve and uh, will, will, will go higher. In fact, interesting fact, Warren Buffett has been buying a lot of banks. In fact, 60%, 60% of his portfolio is concentrated in US banks, like JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, US Bangkok, right? So I would say that's a bit extreme to focus 60% of your portfolio to banks, but the point is that he sees value in banks and, and so do I, and specifically JP Morgan and BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world. Okay, I know it's been a pretty long webinar. I'd like to thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end. I hope it's been valuable. So let me do a quick summary of the opportunities for 2019. Number one, opportunity. The current bear market in US stocks is unlikely to lead to a recession and offers, again, value investors an opportunity to buy great companies at a and huge discounts. However, the US economy is at the late stage of its economic cycle. We're in the final inning like it or not. A recession will come eventually, probably next year. Well, not now, probably next year. So best to focus on high quality companies that are less economically sensitive and that can weather the storm, All right? Like I said, Adobe, Microsoft, Alphabet, Facebook, uh, my favorites, okay? Uh, my favorite sectors are communication services, technology, and finance. And again, you could buy the individual companies or invest in the ETFs of those sectors. Um, China's the, the exciting place. So China is the long-term world growth leader, like it or not, um, um, is undervalued. Risk to return is very compelling at these prices. So like I said, right, in China, it could still go down another 10 or 20%, but the potential upside in the next bull market is two to 500%. So you're risking a dollar to make 20 bucks, pretty good deal. Uh, so I see China may probably outperform US equities in the next five years or so. Again, China ETFs like GXC, FXI, EWH are China ETFs listed in the US that you could trade with using any of the major brokers in the world. Um, finally, a piece of good news, if you don't already know, um, I'll be launching together with my uh, partner, Mr. Bang Fang Van. He's, you know, Bang is one of the best option uh, traders and strategists I know. In fact, most of my uh, accounts, uh, the options related accounts are managed by, by Bang. Uh, Bang's originally from Vietnam, uh, but he's been living in Singapore, working with me um, for the last, um, well, he's been in Singapore for the last, I think like 24 years. He's a senior uh, manager in an, a multinational company and one of the best option traders I know. So together we've created a professional options trading course uh, to really help you to become better traders. So especially if you are an investor, uh, and you've got a portfolio of stocks, options can help you to protect your portfolio and increase your returns by generating more streams of income, okay? Uh, options are a very powerful tool used by both investors like Warren Buffett and short-term traders. So 
For investors, you can actually use options to hedge your portfolio during a bear market. It's like buying insurance. So options are an insurance tool where you can protect your portfolio. So if the market collapses, you don't lose money. In fact, you can still make money during a bear market. Options can be used to generate additional income from an investment portfolio by um, collecting premiums, selling covered call options. You can also use options to buy stocks at a discount or even for free in specific situations. So again, if you're an investor, uh, do invest in learning about options. We've got an options course coming up. The first uh, level of course will be launched sometimes in the, sometime in the next 30 days. So watch out for it. If you'd like to have uh, be one of our first enrollments to get a very, very big discount of the retail price, uh, you can send an email to support at piranaprofits.com. Leave us your name. You'll be the first to be informed once it's launched. You can get our um, so-called pre-launch uh, sale uh, price. Okay. Uh, if you are a short-term trader, and those of you in the US, you may have problems trading with margin uh, because of high margin costs and you can't get CFDs, you could trade using options as well. So options is a, a really good alternative to trade um, with very little money controlling a large amount of stock, okay? So options require less capital. For example, you can control an Apple stock at $200 with as little as $10, okay? It allows you to magnify your returns and minimize your risk when used correctly. Options can also be used to generate profits under any market conditions. So whether the market goes up, goes down, goes sideways, you can construct option strategies to profit consistently. All right, so you can find out more by you know, watching my Introduction to Options video on YouTube, it's there in my channel. And again, enroll in our course once it's launched in the next 30 days. Thank you for listening and may the markets be with you. Happy trading, investing in 2019. If you like this video, do click the subscribe button for more videos. If you'd like to find out about our online professional forex and stock trading courses, do visit piranaprofits.com for international students. And for our uh, students in Asia, we have our live stock trading and investing courses at wealthacademyglobal.com. This is Adam Koo signing off. May the markets be with you.